Hi, I'm Ashley with Campbell. Thanks for investing your time to help your community be a great place to live. Before you watch the video, make sure to click the subscribe button so that we can help you make educated decisions as a board member. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evan Bradley. I'm one of the partners of Campbell, and uh, we have been in business here in South Florida since 1953. I am a licensed CAM, and I work very closely with some of our largest clients uh, with the major issues that face their associations. Um, again, we manage over 400 and, uh, HOA and condominium association clients in Dade, Broward, Palm, Palm Beach, Martin, and St. Lucie counties, all here in South Florida. With us today is a special guest, Michael Kassauer. He is with the firm Frank Weinberg and Black. For those of you who've been on with us before have probably seen Michael. He's going to help us understand the implications of the Fair Housing Act on condos and HOAs. Uh, during the registration, we did see quite a few questions about uh, emotional support, animals, or ESAs. We will cover that, but this is not exclusively an ESA presentation. There are several areas of the Fair Housing Act that are extremely relevant to those of us in uh, condominium and HOA world, so we do want to make sure we cover those as well, uh, because any uh, violations of the HA, FHA or even just a lawsuit uh, related to the FHA could cost you uh, increased insurance premiums or an expensive visit to federal court. So we'd like to try to make you aware of all the things happening in that realm. So Michael, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and the firm? Thank you so much, Evan, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, thanks to Campbell for allowing me to join today. Uh, this is a really, really important topic, I think for all community associations throughout the state of Florida and beyond. Um, emotional support animals are certainly the hot button issue, but uh, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and launch into my PowerPoint, give a little bit about myself, and uh, also dive into the substance. Please do. So let's let's kick off the party. All right. Just while you're doing that, I want to remind everybody this is not legal advice. If you do have questions about your specific community, please reach out to your association's attorney. Um, do not use our slides as a substitute for speaking with your legal counsel. Uh, do take advantage of the Q&A. We'll try to get to uh, as many questions as we can, but it has to be limited to high level questions about the course material, any specific questions about your association or your personal legal situation, we're just not going to be able to get to today. So back to you, Michael. All right. Beautiful. Thank, thank you for the legal disclaimer, Evan. You, you nailed it. Um, all right. Let's continue on. Okay, so, so first of all, Evan invited me to introduce myself. Let me do just that, and I'll tell you about the firm as well. Um, my name is Michael Kassauer. I am an attorney with the law firm of Frank Weinberg and Black. We are a mainstay here in the South Florida area for going on, I believe, four decades or so now. Uh, we were founded in the 1980s by our original partners, Stephen Weinberg and Neil Frank. Stephen Weinberg is still the managing partner of the firm, a uh, founding partner of the firm, active, active practitioner. Um, and he was the original partner that developed our firm's condominium and HOA practice. We have represented uh, we have represented hundreds of community associations throughout the state of Florida for the duration of our firm's practice. Um, and me, myself, I am a board certified condominium and plan development lawyer, one of a couple hundred of us that exist in the state. Um, one of the great things, though, about our firm, Frank Weinberg and Black, is we are about 26 lawyers deep. And we have people that specialize in all aspects of community association representation. I mention this because people talk about condo law like it is a narrow field of practice, but in reality, condominium associations, homeowners associations, especially when you get to the larger scale, you're a business like any other. You will have real estate issues, you will have construction issues, you will have employment issues, you will have discrimination issues, um, you will have any number of things that might come up, collections, foreclosure, I could go on and on. And the nice thing about a firm like ours is we have the masters of all trades instead of the masters of none. Um, we have people that specialize in all aspects of community association representation. Myself, I've been fortunate enough in my career to be exposed to most of these areas. And I actually am, a, like I said, one of the couple hundred board certified attorneys in the state of Florida in this area of practice. And, and, and I like to lend that experience in my capacity as general counsel. And I am, for all of my clients, the direct point of contact. Um, I am a South Floridian born and raised. I did spend seven years in Gainesville uh, with my education. I now live in one of the, uh, the best uh, communities in, in the state of Florida, as far as I'm concerned, managed by the team at Campbell Property Management in Parkland, Florida, where I am raising my two daughters um, and, and enjoying every second of it. 
If you'd like to reach out at all, my, my contact information is right there on your screen, my email address and the office phone number. I will say though, that once we start to have our relationship, everybody that deals with me, even if you're just a potential client, gets my personal cell phone. I really do believe in direct communication and active communication and like to be available for my clients. It's one of, one of the things I really put a, a ton of effort into right alongside delivering top quality legal services. So this is what we're here to talk about today. That, this is why you're here. Let, let, let's get the show on the road. We're here to talk about the Fair Housing Act. Um, and we're going to talk about some other collateral things that deal with discrimination matters, because we're calling the presentation the Fair Housing Act, but it does implicate some other legal authorities as well. And big picture, what we're going to talk about today is discrimination matters. We're going to talk about the use of background checks and credit scores in, as part of the screening process of potential owners or tenants in your community, because that's when a lot of these discrimination claims come up. We're also going to talk about matters concerning disabilities, um, requests for accommodations, modifications, and what the difference is between the two. And then we're going to spend probably the most time talking about everybody's favorite issues, the, 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 the beloved emotional support animal that every board of directors calls me to say, Michael, how do we get more of these emotional support animals into our communities? We cannot get enough. We love them, love them, love them. And if you're not sensing the sarcasm, I am absolutely bathing in it. I love dogs. I have two dogs myself, a Weimaraner and a Doberman. I live in a community that allows them as pets. Um, but I am saying this all very tongue in cheek because the reality is most community associations that call me about emotional support animals are saying, Michael, how do we stop this? Because we know there are abuses occurring. And that's just reality. Unfortunately, um, as we'll discuss, the emotional support animal law is abused. But there are some very careful constraints we need to talk about as to how you navigate that process so you don't expose your association potential claims for discrimination based upon disability, because that's what underlies the whole emotional support animal concept is a request for a reasonable accommodation based upon disability. From there, we're also going to proceed to talk a little bit about familial status discrimination, including specifically 55 and older communities and the Housing for Older Persons Act. That is the name of a federal law that, that provides some exemptions from potential discrimination based upon age or familial status where we are dealing with a 55 and older community. Uh, we are also gonna finally talk about a concept that does not come up uh, quite as much, but when it does, it could be riddled with landmines. And that is the potential implication of liability against the association when there are disputes between neighbors. Something that you might not think of, but something you should be mindful of because there are claims actively existing in this state right now against associations for basically a failure to intervene and prevent um, ongoing uh, discrimination or alleged discrimination involving an, uh, an owner and another owner. And while the association may think, hey, that's between them, sometimes it actually is more complicated than that. And a dispute that seems like it's between owners or tenants could in fact give rise to liability against the association should the association fail to act. And we will discuss that, what that means in a little more detail shortly. But first, let's do the broad overview you see on the screen. Back in 1968, when LBJ was our president of these United States, the United States Congress enacted and the president signed into law the Fair Housing Act. And that was for the purpose of preventing housing discrimination based upon race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. As time went on, though, the, the law was expanded. And in 1988, Congress enacted an amended act that expanded the scope of the FHA to also prevent discrimination based upon familial status and handicap. And there was born the emotional support animal. But I digress, Let, let's lead up to the, that, that, that main event that I know everyone's here to see. Um, in, in the meantime though, Florida did adopt its own, uh, its own extension of the Fair Housing Act, its own version. It's a state counterpart to the federal law. So just be mindful that you're gonna hear sometimes about the FFHA, that's Florida's Fair Housing Act, for the purpose of this conversation, though, today, just know that courts have recognized that they should be construed, that this Florida Act should be construed consistent with the federal law. So while there is a lot of overlap, at the end of the day, they are generally, for most purposes, um, consistent with one another and interpreted consistently with one another, which is helpful because we have a wide body of federal case law in the Fair Housing Act. And that allows us here in Florida to look to these federal court decisions in order to, to interpret our own state law. 
Now let's talk about what we're talking about when we mean discrimination. And, and let me be clear, I'm giving you here some of the main ones that we see here in condo land or HOA land, whichever you might reside in personally. The main types of things that I see when it comes to discrimination claims, it has to do with provision of services. That's B that you see there, provision of services. And then A, which is basically the sale and, and lease approval process. Under A, you're talking about the association screening process and you wanna make sure that you're not doing anything that implies any sort of discrimination for one of those protected classes you see under that, uh, that, that uh, subsection A on your screen. I'm talking about race, color, religion, sex, familial status, or national origin. If you engage in a discriminatory practice relative to sale and lease approval for any of those categories, then you could be exposing your association to discrimination. B is the one that comes up uh, typically more in the context of, um, of, of things like uh, disability discrimination, um, but it also can be things like familial status as well, and that's the provision of services. So what we're talking about here could be that are you going to allow an emotional support animal so Mrs. Smith is able to go to enjoy the use of the facilities, meaning that she needs to have the emotional support animal with her at all times to function. It's been prescribed properly, documentation provided, and she wants to go to the pool. If you have a no pet policy at the pool, can you enforce that against an emotional support animal? Spoiler alert, the answer is no, but obviously you have to overcome some hurdles to get there. Familial status is another one. I've had associations that have had actions brought against them where let's say for instance, we say no children allowed at the pool. That's a problem. You cannot do that when you're talking about familial status or you could expose your association to familial status discrimination. Um, so provision of services is a thing, but also the threshold to get in the community, sale and lease approval. This is what we're gonna now break out into a greater level of detail, but these are the big categories of discrimination that I see in the context of community associations. Now, to break out the definition a little bit more, and these are some specific subsections from the Fair Housing Act, um, let's talk about what discrimination means. It's a refusal to permit at, uh, um, at, to the, the equal use and enjoyment of the property, but specifically what we're talking about here on the screen right now is another concept that you don't see quite as often, but it does come up. And that's the concept of a reasonable modification as opposed to a reasonable accommodation. And when you're dealing with a reasonable modification, that's when you typically have a disabled person that specifically comes to you and says, for instance, I need a wheelchair ramp. And we're going to give some more, uh, some, um, some more um, examples in a little bit. But the, the bottom line is that you, again, and I, we're going to say this over and over again throughout this presentation, equal use and enjoyment of the property is what is critical here, especially to the extent that it is not infringe on the rights of others. So when you are dealing with that type of situation where someone says, hey, I just wanna use the property like everyone else and I'm willing to do my part to make it happen, whether that's provide the necessary documentation or potentially even pay for a structural modification to the property, you have to reasonably cooperate that with that subject to certain limitations. So now let's talk about a little bit more of the sale and lease approval process and the use of credit uh, checks and background checks. One of the questions that we get a lot uh, from our firm is, Michael, how, what types of conditions can we put on sale and lease approval? And the answer is typically that we are generally comfortable with criminal background checks and financial background checks. And the association in most instances can condition occupancy upon meeting certain standards that are established often within the board's discretion or otherwise set forth in the governing documents. Now, what you need to be mindful of here is when you establish these thresholds, are you in fact being reasonable? What I see most often is credit score on the financial front. And then for criminal background, we have to really focus on what the crime was. Does it pose a threat to person or property? And how long ago did it occur? If Mrs. Smith was a really big Grateful Dead fan back in the 70s and 80s and went to a lot of Grateful Dead shows and got caught with a joint, to, sorry to be casual, but don't, let's just say it like it is, a crime that was committed of a, of on a smaller level like that 30, 40 years ago, probably not posing much of a threat to the property today. Conversely, if Mrs. Smith got convicted for drug trafficking five years ago, we're talking about a, 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 you know, a little bit more of a genuine threat to the property. Um, similarly, if we have somebody that has a, uh, you know, a violent past, then you might be talking about something that you can roll back the clock a little bit more. And let's say somebody got convicted of um, you know, some sort of 
violent battery 10, 12 years ago. Probably, although this is all case by case and you should, um, you know, something you should consult with your counsel, like Evan said at the outset, if you're talking about something that's violent and really out of the ordinary, you probably can justify going a little further back into the past and relying on that crime as a basis to deny. Now, one thing that I've seen come up from time to time is, hey, Michael, can we require them to produce copies of their tax returns? There is actually a trial court decision out there that took issue with that. Now, it took issue with that when the person also met, I think, an 800 credit score requirement. So we're talking about really the board maybe in, in, in one argument being a little overzealous. Heck, if you need an 800 credit score, do we really need tax returns? The judge sort of opined that if you didn't have the credit score, maybe the tax returns could be brought into play. But at the end of the day, here's what I'll say. Talk to your attorney if you want to get stricter, but for the most part, you want to talk about criminal background checks and you want to talk about credit score. Those are the typical standards you see. And of course, all of this will be subject to a reasonableness standard because typically this is all broken out as an arm of our rulemaking authority as opposed to provisions embedded in your declaration. And from there, you should be okay. But you wanna make sure that you do have these rights in your governing documents. You wanna make sure you have the rulemaking authority. You wanna make sure you actually have the approval processes because heck, is it really reasonable to be screening these people if we don't have an approval process? So. These are the kinds of things you should be thinking about on the credit and background check front. A couple of points there too, Michael. I always advise our associations, if you're going to deny someone, it typically doesn't happen very often. Always consult your attorney prior to denial and even consider having your attorney write that denial letter um, because it costs a little bit up front, but an improper denial can be extremely costly. And, and what some members of your committee or board may think is a common sense approach to using a background check uh, may not be based on the current, you know, guidelines and case law, um, even though it might have been acceptable five or, or 10 years ago. So I strongly advise all of you to utilize your attorney if you're going to issue a denial letter. Hey, amen, Evan. And actually, you bring up a really good point because something I should mention for the Broward County associations out there, mm -hmm. um, and this always makes me think of Alice in Wonderland. You'll, you'll see where I'm going in a second. There is Broward County Ordinance 16 and a half. Um, and it's literally a fraction. That's why I think of Alice in Wonderland. Um, but uh, the, 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 under Broward County Ordinance 16 and a half, there is a unique requirement in the county ordinance for an association to provide a reason for the denial. So you can't just say no. So like that, that's a good example right there to, to, to give further credence to Evan's point and advice. You want to consult with counsel because you could have a local requirement to provide something more um, when you're dealing with the denial letter than is apparent based on the face of your governing documents or even a Florida statute 718. Right. And another problem we see too is uh, if you're leaving these approvals and denials up to the, I'll say, opinion or gut of the a particular board member or committee members and those committees and boards change, um, your standards for what may have been approved and denied can change wildly over the years. And if you do end up in a lawsuit and you have not been consistent using consistent criteria, you could really be in big trouble. So I strongly encourage you to develop standard criteria for what may be acceptable and not acceptable and enforce that on a very consistent basis. The more uh, consistent you are, the more likely you are to, to not have trouble. But again, consult counsel on when you establish those guidelines. Absolutely. And, and it's really, it's, it's excellent advice because Evan talked about the costliness of federal litigation earlier. A lot of times when you're dealing with these types of matters, and I'll, I'll, I'll just talk for a minute before we get into disabilities here, you, you get a lot of these proceedings can happen in federal court. They can also happen in local administrative agencies, county level agencies. And let me tell you, these agencies, once you get sucked into that vortex, and that's really what it is, they tend to be very friendly to the complainant or the homeowner or the tenant or whatever they might be. And so even if you are right, like Evan said when he was talking about the federal court actions, you could be spending a lot of money and dealing with an uphill battle with somebody who is candidly, while they are supposed to be somewhat neutral, they tend to be advocates for, for the little guy, I'll call it. And they tend to view the little guy as the person complaining without any sort of distinction as to whether that person is just being a nuisance or up to no good. So it can be expensive, time consuming, and you might have the deck stacked against you in one of those agencies. All right, so now we're going to go on to disability discrimination. We're going to talk about requests for reasonable accommodations as distinguished from requests for reasonable modifications. And this is where we are going to talk about the beloved emotional support animal. Now, 
like we started to introduce before, for the purpose of this subsection, when you're dealing with discrimination and request for reasonable modification, uh, what you need to do here is allow people the ability for a reasonable modification to allow for full enjoyment to the premises. Except in the case of a rental, landlord uh, may limit it to where the condition for modification is based upon the, the renter agreeing to restore the premises. What does this mean? So bottom line is when you're dealing with requests for reasonable modifications, you're talking about a change to a public or common use area. And that's what well, now we're moving on from a, the, that prior statute was talking a little more from the perspective of the owner and the landlord tenant relationship. But when you're the association, you're talking about a modification to a public or common use area of the building. And you are, believe it or not, as a homeowner, allowed to request a modification to the common space for your equal use and enjoyment. Now, the interesting thing about this is that so long as you're traveling under the Fair Housing Act, meaning that you are a residential property, you do not have commercial components, you are not um, open to the outside world, meaning public use, you are going to be able to pass along the expense of this modification to the person that is making the request. Let me give you an example. If I, for instance, was wheelchair bound or otherwise handicapped and limited in my ability to get to a pool, and I wanted to have one of those chairs, those electronic chairs that you see at hotels all the time that allow somebody to sit down and it's got the robotic arm that then lowers the person into the pool. I, as a homeowner, am entitled to do that, but I'm not entitled to make the association pay for it. So we're gonna go through some more, more, more um, examples here, but the nice thing is that federal law does provide protections to people like this, but it also provides the right sort of financial protection, in my opinion, to the association in the sense that they can pass along the expense to the person making the request so that the owners don't bear that expense. That way, nobody that is not using that, that feature has to financially bear responsibility. Um, and then by the, by the same token, the handicapped person is able to enjoy the property just like everyone else. By the way, you also can condition the installation on the person making the request being responsible for restoring the property back to its original condition once they are no longer using that feature or potentially leave the property and sell their unit. Good question for you, Michael. Does that extend to maintenance of the item? A chair like that obviously could have serious maintenance responsibilities during its, its lifespan. Absolutely. You can pass along all those expenses. What I recommend typically, and again, consult with your own lawyer, my firm has uh, distilled a really strong form that we've used in these instances that break these things out. Because the last thing you want to do when somebody comes to you with a request like this is fly by the scene of your pants, approve it, and then have all these things pop up along the way. So we have a nice form and any quality association attorney should be able to help you with this. But we have a nice form here at FWB that breaks out the responsibilities, insurance, indemnification, maintenance, everything. So people go in eyes wide open. Because in my experience, that communication at the outset saves you a whole lot of pain down the road. But yes, to answer your question, Evan, you can pass along those, those recurring maintenance expenses or whatever the feature is that's installed. Mm -hmm. Here are some other examples that we see uh, uh, from time to time. We do see lowering the entry threshold into the unit. Uh, grab bars in bathrooms. Remember, we do have not just inside individual units, but we do have common area, common element bathrooms, um, a ramp into the building. And then also I mentioned the pool chair li uh, lift. These are the types of things that we see as examples of reasonable modifications. And again, I want to say it over and over again to emphasize the nomenclature, the verbiage. Modifications are when they're making changes to the property. Accommodations are have tend to, tend to have more to do with the use of the property um, in the sense of things that you need that do not require structural changes to the interior or the exterior of the condominium property itself. Now we're moving on to where the emotional support animals live and that's, uh, that's the reasonable accommodation. Um, and under federal law, a, a, a discrimination for failure to make a reasonable accommodation includes uh, uh, the refusal to provide an exception to rules, policies, practices. Again, not talking about structural changes here. We're talking about the, making exceptions to certain rules, for instance, a no pet policy um, and allowing an emotional support animal or something like that so that somebody that is disabled can have equal use and enjoyment of those same facilities that all other owners and occupants get to enjoy. Number one is what you see right there, what we keep talking about over and over again, um, a no pet policy. Um, now you'll see number one does talk about a service animal as opposed to an emotional support animal. And we'll talk a little bit about what the difference is between the two. It's an important, important difference. 
Um, a blind person would be enjoying the service animal typically. An emotional support animal uh, uh, is, a, is a different situation. Um, now, uh, another example we have on number two, and this is one that, that we see sometimes as a pretty controversial subject because parking is valuable stuff. Um, you can have a situation where an owner makes a request uh, to provide a designated parking space near their unit because the person is not able to walk. Now, obviously, these things should be evaluated on a case by case basis because all the, the physical plants of every single community association property is different. But you could very well be in a situation where you are reasonably obligated to provide a reserve parking space to somebody um, that is going to need that reasonable that that space to be close to their unit due to physical limitations on their ability to to, to move around and walk around um, and, and allow them to park and get to their unit in a way that does not somehow uh, cause issues due to their disability. And here is the definition, just to say it in no uncertain terms, according to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, a reasonable accommodation is a change, exception, adjustment to a rule, policy, practice, or service that may be necessary for a person with a disability to have an equal opportunity, not a, not a unique opportunity, but an equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling, and that does include common spaces, that's where they hook us in as the community association, or to fulfill their program obligations. So equal opportunity, I want to pause for a minute and emphasize that. While you really do need to look at this all in case by case with, with counsel, the accommodation should not prevent your non-disabled owners from having that same use as everyone else. And there are scenarios that come up where sometimes providing that accommodation to the person making the request could have a negative effect on everybody else. And that's when that equal opportunity language might be the foothold to try to set things up so that the person making the request does not somehow make things to say it in a crude way, worse for everybody else, not to be insensitive to the disability, of course. So now let's talk about, um, and I said we were gonna talk about the ESAs the most, let's talk about how you evaluate these requests. And I could talk about this one for, for several hours. I'm actually gonna reference a, me uh, a memo that came from HUD uh, a couple of years ago that, that really breaks this out into about 18 or 20 pages. But let's talk about how you should be evaluating these things big picture when the requests come in. So let's say you receive a request for an accommodation for an emotional support animal or a service animal. The first thing you wanna ask yourself is, okay, am I an FHA or am I an ADA? Fair Housing Act or, or Americans with Disabilities Act? The big thing there is if the association does not permit stays of 30 days or less and doesn't function like a hotel, it's probably the FHA. Now you could be in a situation where you're a mixed use association where you have commercial units. That could be something else that subjects you to the ADA. You could have a country club facility that's open to the public, meaning you don't have to be an owner. That could subject you to the ADA. But if you are purely a residential property that is only available for use by the occupants of the property, well, then you're just the Fair Housing Act. And the analysis is a little more favorable, at least from the financial perspective. Because again, like I told you before, if you are dealing with a request for a modification under the Fair Housing Act, you can pass along expenses to the requesting party. Conversely, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, you may have obligations to do certain things at your own expense, like installing ramps, um, things of that nature, and grab bars in the bathrooms. If you're a place of public accommodation, the rules change. So at the end of the day, if the association does not permit stays of 30 days or less and doesn't function like a, a hotel or a place of public accommodation, again, likely just under the FHA, more friendly for your community association in most instances. Now, to continue down that whole analysis decision tree of when you're dealing with these requests, let's start off by saying, what does it mean to be handicapped? Uh, it means it in, in very simple terms, it's a physical or mental impairment. So it can be mental, that's the emotional support animal again, which substantially limits one or more major life activities. Now, major life activities are super broad. It could be breathing. It could be so, it could be, it could be moving around in the world, which could be something that means that I just get really, really anxious and I can't speak when I'm out, the, out and about. Um, it, 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 there is such broad um, considerations for major life activities that almost anything can be implicated. Um, you do need to have a record of such impairment. Um, and, and then from there, um, you need to make sure that, 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 that nothing about that impairment does not include any sort of um, any sort of illegal actions or, or any sort of addiction to a controlled substance because 
um, you're not going to be able to use that as the basis uh, to establish that you know, I'm an addict, therefore I need to have an accommodation. Um, now the record of the impairment is a, se is a, a separate analysis. We're gonna break that out further. How does somebody have to document the existence of their disability? Um, continuing on, this is just a, a further breaking out that definition of disability, nothing really uh, s supplemental on this slide in particular. Um, but a developmental disability could be something else that is implicated here. Um, some of these things are visually apparent, some of them are not, and that is where we get the analysis to be a little more complex. I did cover some of this before, so I'll just fly through it re uh, real quickly, but it'll be nice that you'll have these slides after once Ashley circulates them to really just show that major life activities, it includes walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, learning, and working, anything pretty much. Substantially limits means unable to perform the life activity that an average person can perform. Um, it could be a significant restriction um, as well. So it's, it's a pretty low threshold at the end of the day. Um, it's not something that when you're dealing with that concept of an emotional support animal, that's hard to meet. And it's also really hard to challenge. So I keep bringing this up because the, this is one of the biggest frustrations I have in trying to service my clients is you see abuses of the emotional support animal stuff all the time. But at the end of the day, because the thresholds are so low and because the agencies that you will get sucked into, again, that's the vortex, are so complainant friendly, the totality of these circumstances make this area riddled with landmines if you try to present a challenge. So as an attorney, you know, we always want to try to fight and I love a good fight, but you need to be mindful of the risks that are posed here by these thresholds just being so darn low. Further breaking things out, this will be a friendly chart for you late, uh, later. You have some physical impairments, you have some me mental impairments. Again, you got pretty much anything on here. So you just have to be really, really sensitive uh, to, to the idea that we could be in a situation where you know somebody in the bottom of your heart is abusing the system, but is it really, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the fight really worth it? Because at the end of the day, I mean, look at the right side of your screen here. Some of these impairments, depression, I mean, you know, how do you prove or disprove something like that, especially once they have a medical provider uh, present the competent evidence? That's the language you deal with in this area, competent evidence to, to verify the existence of the condition and the prescription for the accommodation. Now let's get to the heart of it, evaluating a request for an assistance animal. Now, before we go into the emotional support animal only, let's break things out a little bit. Support animals and service animals. Um, a support animal is what you're dealing with typically with an ESA, an emotional support animal. They don't require any specialized training, um, really of any kind. Um, they just need to provide therapeutic emotional support to a person, and that's good enough. And the evidence that needs to be provided to verify this is super small, super low. You could have a four or five sentence letter from a medical provider. Could be a psychologist, could be a nurse, could be a doctor could be a chiropractor, could be so many different things, a medical provider. And you, you have a situation there that if the prescription says that Mrs. Smith suffers from a disability that impairs one or more major life activities and that the existence of this animal will ameliorate the symptoms of that disability and allow that person to you know, ameliorate some of those major life activities, you're basically gonna be at a place where they have produced the competent evidence. Now you can request that. Uh, documentation from the medical provider is the good news. When you're dealing with a service animal, it's a little bit of a different situation. And you want to be very careful with your inquiries when you're dealing with service animals, when you're dealing with something that has a visually apparent um, disability. For instance, if somebody is walking through your lobby uh, and saying, and, and let's say they have one of those uh, seeing, uh, seeing eye, eye canes and they have their dog with them, you know what the situation is there. You don't really need a medical provider's letter in order to establish that, hey, the person that is blind has, has a seeing eye dog. So there's a distinction between how you treat the two when you have a visually apparent disability with a service animal, as opposed to a non-visually apparent disability, an emotional disability, and a support animal. Now that, that little note you see in the middle of the screen, the bold, follow the FHEO 2020-01 best practices guide, I encourage you to Google that one. I can send it to you as well. That's the FHA uh, memo that was put out in 2020, I believe. And it is the best thing you could ever ask for as a housing provider in the sense it breaks out everything into a whole full-blown decision tree. 
what questions you can ask, when, service animal, support animal, everything basically you're going to see on this particular topic in today's presentation and much, much more, it really gives you, it holds your hand on how you should administer these requests to come in. So I truly encourage you to download that. If this is a sensitive issue in your community, circulate that memo to management, circulate it to the board, have everybody spend a half hour to an hour going through it carefully, and you will become so educated on the subject once you finish reading that, that you will be, find yourself probably smarter than half the attorneys out there that are giving advice on the subject. No kidding at all on that. It is a very thorough memo. And if you take the time to read it carefully, you will find that you become very bright on these issues. Now, there is a consideration of the fact that as a federal memo, there are Florida laws on this issue, but there's a whole separate analysis of whether the Florida law is preempted by federal law. But generally, they are pretty in line with one another. So you will find that it is pretty, pretty darn close to what you need to know when you look at that, that FHA memo. Uh, but again, the first part of this analysis is, is the disability visible and is the need apparent? If it's, if it's a visible and apparent, you just approve it. But if it's not, look to the memo, look to everything else, talk to your attorney, and make sure that you're looking into that, that, that the animal is reasonably tied to the disability maybe. But once you get that prescription from a medical provider, odds are you're heading in, in a certain direction. There is a reasonable inquiry though that you can engage in. All right. Now we're talking about a little bit here under the Florida law, uh, the FFHA, Florida Statute 760.27. Um, what this restates here is that a person with a disability must, upon the request of the housing provider, be allowed to keep the, the animal in the dwelling, and such person cannot be required to provide extra compensation. That's important because a lot of times associations have pet fees. You'll say, okay, everybody's got to provide a pet deposit or a pet fee because they have a dog on the premises. You can't charge any fees when you're dealing with these service animals or support animals as well. The Florida law affirms that thing, that statement, which we already knew under federal law. You cannot charge any extra compensation. But again, the Florida law, Florida statute 760.27 does supplement the federal law, and it should be reviewed both, uh, both in conjunction with the federal law in order to ensure you are on all four corners. Under the Florida law, an ESA is dealt with as a, spe a specific component of an animal which does not require training. Again, very analogous here to the federal law. And it underscores something really important here. And this is the one that I find hysterical in my experience. People will say, oh, Michael, they didn't provide the certificate. The certificate's meaningless. It doesn't help. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't do a darn thing. The vest doesn't do a darn thing. Nobody cares if your Pomeranian is wearing one of those cute red vests. At the end of the day, what you need to know is that the animal has been prescribed by a medical provider. This, the vests, the certificates, they're all for show. And don't get me wrong, I'll be very proud of Sparky if Sparky has earned that certificate. But at the same time, Sparky, that's not going to get you in the door at XYZ Condominium Association. You need to make sure that you have your, your prescription from the medical provider. Uh, but once that's done, you can't charge extra uh, compensation. You can't charge a pet deposit. Um, or, and you can't, by the way, engage in breed restrictions either. So if I have an emotional support, you know, Mastiff, get ready for that 140 pound Mastiff to be trucking through the elevator along with all your residents. Um, now, if the Mastiff starts biting people, that's a problem. Your service animal and support animal cannot be a, a nuisance, but pit bulls, um, Mastiffs, Dobermans, Rottweilers, they are not allowed to be restricted uh, based upon their breed purely. If they're a nuisance, if they bark too much, if they bite too much, and any amount of biting is too much, um, then, then you can uh, deal with the situation a little bit differently. But if it's just a matter of a well-behaved Mastiff or Doberman scaring people in the community, that is not going to probably be enough for you to block that service or support animal. Further breaking out the Florida law here, a housing provider may not deny the request. Again, this is all sounding familiar to the federal law. If in, unless the uh, but, and, but uh, if it does not pose a threat to the safety or health of others, but if it does pose a threat to person or property, you have a little bit of more of an argument to deny the request. Again, just like the, now looking at the second part here, if the person's disability is not readily apparent, you can rec request some reliable information. But uh, if the, the disability is visually apparent. Again, to the most, uh, I keep saying again here, I'll try to watch it, but if it's anything where it's a visually apparent disability, the cane being the most obvious example, don't, don't harass that person. Don't make them produce things. You are going to be exposing your association. 
um, further breaking things out and further demonstrating the similarities here between the Florida, the federal law. Um, a lot of this is, I'm gonna focus on the highlighted language here. A lot of claims of discrimination um, are not based on the outright denial, but it's based on upon what I'll call the harassment. If you start asking a million questions, even if you ultimately approve, you're gonna find that you're actually exposing yourself to your, meaning your association, simply based on the fact that you were viewed as being somewhat obstructive. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you are not being unreasonable in the interactive discourse that you have with the requesting party. Um, and you, so that's something that is very important to remember is it's not just a denial or an acceptance that could subject you. You could have something like a constructive denial or a harassment situation where you just subject the person to too many, um, too many different uh, requests or questions in order to get them through the door with their service or support animal. To double back though to the first half of this slide that you see on the screen, you can still require proof of vaccination um, for these emotional support and service animals. So there are certain things that you can request but you can't necessarily request everything that you might think seems logical. Obviously, the vaccination component has its own unique uh, considerations in the sense that you're dealing with something that could pose a threat to the health and safety of others on the condominium property or HOA property. Therefore, you can ask those questions. One point I want to bring up, Michael, too, about those uh, discrimination lawsuits. Uh, this insurance environment that we're in right now is extremely tight and uh, tighter than it's ever been in, in and what ends up happening if you do have a claim is you're going to turn that over to your DNO carrier typically. And a lot of associations will say, well, we don't necessarily mind because we're covered by insurance. So we think we're right and we're going to let the insurance company fight it out. And it, it won't cost us very much, maybe a small deductible. But what it will cost you, particularly in this market, is when you go out and you try to renew that insurance with an open claim, even if you're proven to be right, you're going to probably get dropped by your current DNO carrier and your insurance rate's going to go up five, maybe 10 times what it was on that DNO policy before. Their DNO policies are very cheap until you have a claim. And then they can be, you know, 25, 50, a hundred thousand dollars. I've I've seen where they've had multiple claims. So just you really don't want to get a claim uh, because just being right could cost you tens of thousands of dollars and increase premiums. Um, so be very careful uh, that you're not tiptoeing a line where you may find yourself with a claim or two because you'll pay either way. Great advice, business advice, legal advice. It, it's just reality right now. The insurance marketplace is brutal um, and, and Evan's absolutely spot on right to say you should be very gingerly walking around this area because even though you know you're right, it can get real expensive for your community and your residents. All right, this is another one that comes up all the time. Michael, I'm calling you because Mrs. Smith is refusing to complete our ESA forms. We made these really good forms that have all these areas, these fields that need to be filled out, signatures, documentations, all these different things. And, and Mrs. Smith is just being difficult saying, I gave you what I needed to give you. Let, let Fluffy move into the condominium. And here is the reality. Mrs. Smith is right. Once you produce the reasonably acceptable evidence under Florida and federal law, which is predominantly that letter, and again, you can also request vaccination, but the letter from a medical provider saying Mrs. Smith suffers from a disability, the disability impairs one or more major life act functions, and the presence of the animal will ameliorate that disability, Mrs. Smith and Fluffy are allowed to coexist together at the condo. And that's, that's pretty much how it goes. You should not be focusing on a necessity of using your forms. You can make those forms available, but to mandate them, instead of having them be a mechanism to hold the, the applicant's hands, the requesting party's hands, is setting yourself up for issues as a community association. I know these things seem silly. I know they seem hyper-technical, but hear what Evan and I are telling you in the sense that you can be right here, but the price you will pay for your principles could be steep. You might very well have the best interest of your community at heart. You might very well be seen through the nonsense of what this person is holding themselves out as, as a disabled person with the ESA. But once you are sucked into that vortex of the agencies that tend to advocate for these people, once you had to submit that claim to your DNO carrier, being right is not gonna feel so good when it comes with months or years of legal dispute coupled with tens and tens of thousands of dollars in liability that comes simply through, through the increase in your insurance premiums let alone the liability that could result in the claim itself.
There are other things to keep in mind here. If you are worried that the animal is going to, let's say, cause damage to the property, just like I said that the animals are not allowed to be a nuisance on the property, if they cause damage, you can still make the owner responsible. So if you say, gosh, we don't allow pets in this building because we have carpeted hallways. And if the animal does its business in the hallway, we're gonna have to replace the carpet after a period of time. Well, the good news is that the owner is still personally liable for any damage that's caused. It could be injury, could be property damage, and it could be a physical injury or property damage. Either way, the person is still responsible for the acts of the animal. They're not completely immunized. Uh, from liability simply because federal law allows them to have this accommodation and Florida law as well for that matter. So that covers the uh, the ESA and service animal portion presentation. Now we're going to talk a little bit about familial status discrimination, specifically 55 and over communities. This is this implicates another federal law. It's called the Housing for Older Persons Act. Um, it is uh, also known as HOPA not to be confused with anybody that likes to go to the Greek restaurants and scream Opal while they stand on tables. Uh, but under the Housing for Older Persons Act, you are allowed, you are allowed to, um, to basically say, not basically, you're allowed to say that 80% of the units in your community must be occupied by people at least 55 and older. Um, you are allowed to actually say that it has to be even more. Um, and, and basically what you need to do in order to establish this is just first and foremost, confirm that you are adhering to some clear policies and procedures that demonstrate that that's what you are, that you are this kind of community. And you have to have good records on this too. Because one thing that comes up a lot is there'll be a denial of somebody that's under 55 in these communities. And when you end up in dispute, there'll be a tax on the association's record keeping and say, hey, are you truly even tracking this? Um, and if the association is not following clear protocols, you can undercut your ability to limit the number of people in your community or eliminate the existence of people in your community that are in fact under the age of 55. So if you intend to enforce this, you gotta make sure that you have guidelines and good record keeping. Um, and this stuff is all, is all something that should be subject to the rules established by the Department of HUD, Housing and Urban Development for the verification of occupancy. That's the record keeping component as well. Now, like I started to introduce before, um, at least 80% of the units in a, in a HOPA 55 and older community have to be occupied by people 55 and older. And let me say that again, occupied, occupied. It's not ownership, it's occupancy. So one thing that comes up a lot of the time, will be, wait a second, if, I'm, if I own in a 55 year older community, what happens when my day comes and my kids inherit my unit? Can they own it? What do they have to do? Well, the good news is yes, they can own it but they may not be able to occupy it. Um, because at the end of the day, if the association is doing everything they need to under HOPA, then the outcome will be that there are abilities to limit the under 55s, the kids, the inheritors of the property from occupying the unit. They can still own it, they can rent it, but they might have to rent it to somebody or at least one occupant who's over the age of 55 and older. Now, this is another question that comes up a lot is, Michael, is there a requirement that the, the other 20% be occupied by people under 55? The answer is no, it's not a requirement. This is called the 80-20 rule. Um, you need to have at least 80% of the units occupied by people 55 and older. But the other 20%, that's something that's left up to some discretion here. You can still be a 55 and older community if you decide to let the other 20% be occupied by people under 55, but you could also implement a higher standard. You could require 100% of the units have at least one occupant over 55. Um, the, the, this is something that you can establish through your own governance, but it's something you should really contemplate um, because if you don't take the time to contemplate that, then you could be in, in a vague, ambiguous situation, and that's when you run into that whole rigmarole of problems under HOPA because you fail to meet the HUD's guidelines and establish clear record keeping and governance procedures to decide when you're confronting a specific case of do you approve or disapprove, you need to demonstrate that you're conforming with record kept standards in your community. Um, the last bullet point, I'll take a quick moment to say here, the last small bullet point, this doesn't mean that you can't have younger people in, uh, visit, even if you're in a 55 and older with 100% 55 and older occupancy. Um, you know, We'll see a lot of times in a 55 and older that the grandkids come down from New York or New Jersey. Uh, that's just the one we get a lot down here. Um, and the thing is that you can, in most of these instances, 
You have communities that establish reasonable standards, such as allowing guests for up to 15 days, maybe a couple times a year. Usually this can be broken out as, in, as a reasonableness thing under the rulemaking powers, but consult with your attorney to decide, okay, what do my documents say about guests? And can we set up some situations here so that Mrs. Smith can have her grandkids come down from Jersey and stay with her for, for uh, you know, a week or two over the summer or winter break. And now we're reaching our last subject. This is the neighbor to neighbor issues that we mentioned before. Does the association need to get involved? This is a really case specific analysis that you wanna talk about with your, your association attorney. But here's what I'll say. If you get a complaint from one of your owners or are otherwise placed on notice of one of your owners or occupants for that matter, could be a tenant um, saying, hey, I'm Mrs. Smith and I was at the tennis courts and Mrs. Berkowitz was giving me a hard time and she said some really, really nasty things to me about my gender or my race or my religion or any of those protected classes, my sexual orientation, whatever. And every time I go to the tennis courts, this is happening over and over again. Association, what are you going to do about it? Well, the interesting thing is some associations may say that's between you, Mrs. Smith, and you, Mrs. Berkowitz, we're staying out of it. That may make sense to a lot of people, but you should know that there is a risk that you could have liability against the association where that discriminatory environment is, is found to exist, is known to exist by the association. And then despite knowledge of that environment, the association just fails to take prompt action to, to cure the, to discontinue that discriminatory or hostile environment. Mm -hmm. If all that happens, the association could be liable for the acts of third parties other occupants in the community. Um, and But again, this is a circumstantial matter that needs to be analyzed and analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis. If you meet some of these thresholds, though, the reality is that if the association is in a position to exercise control and stop the bad stuff and fails to do so in a reasonably prompt manner, liability can arise. So if you get complaints about this sort of thing, even if it's between owners, pick up the phone, call association council, and see if there's something you need to do to intervene and discont and, and if it's within your powers as an association, stop this bad stuff from happening. Yeah, Michael, we've actually seen a little bit of this. Um, you know where we've actually seen it even more than verbal is uh, on Facebook. Um, you know, community, how many communities on our call today have a Facebook page, have a next door page? Um, and, and that type of harassment is published, it's written, uh, and it can be very easily shown to the association that that Mrs. Smith has written some things uh, disparaging somebody else's race, religion, uh, ethnicity, whatever it might be. Um, and a lot of you know, association documents obviously have the, the right to quiet enjoyment and other things. And they have the ability to um, you know, ban people from the clubhouse or maybe use the resident barcode entrance um, you know, for different behaviors. And if they don't use that authority, again, these are the allegations that have been made. It, you know, these things have to work through the court or whatever. But you know, if they didn't, if they use that authority to stop other types of behavior, and they don't use that authority to try to stop Mrs. Smith's behavior um, when she's disparaging her neighbor's religion or or you know ethnicity on Facebook, um, that's where the liability comes in. So as soon as you're made aware of something like this, particularly. Uh, especially if it's published uh, online somewhere that other community members are seeing it, bring it to the attention of council immediately. Um, you may not be able to stop the behavior, um, but doing nothing may present a problem for you. Um, and again, I go back to if, if you end up with one of these claims and it's a, a mark against your, um, you know, your policy when you go to renew, the, these insurance companies do not care how right you are. They do not care how frivolous Mrs. Smith's claim is. As long as it's making its way through the legal system, you will have massive increases upon renewal of your policies. So uh, again, do everything you can to be proactive um, because even being right has a cost in this environment. It's very sad, it's very unfortunate, um, but it's the reality we're living in in this litigious society. So, so do try to get out in front of these things. And in the meantime, we got to figure out why Mrs. Smith keeps giving everyone a hard time because she's a real pain. <laughs> Poor Mrs. Smith. I'm sure she's a sweet lady. We're going to need a new name for the next one of these. So, <laughs> all right. I, are, we, uh, are we to where we're ready for some Q&A, Michael? 
Absolutely. Let's do it. And, and while we're doing the Q&A, if anybody needs my contact info, you got it right there on the screen as well. But let's let's get to it. I'm an absolute. Right. So uh, Trevor asks in a condo if there's an individual with a handicap placard and they want a specific parking spot reuse, reserved for their use only would the FHA apply in that uh, an accommodation apply there. It, it could very it could very well apply. We did talk a little about the parking space example. It, some of this stuff is on a case by case basis. You do need to look at the physical plant of your condominium and your HOA and analyze how it's going to impact other owners as well. But you could very well be in a situation where somebody is entitled to make that request and be accommodated in that manner. Right. I think you hit on this, but I'm going to ask it again because I hear it maybe most often. Um, is can you restrict using the pool uh, after a certain time period? Um, to can you restrict it so that children under 12 couldn't use it is the example here but I guess any restrict you know could you have blanket restrictions on children at the pool during certain time periods dangerous I don't I, I've, I've had this one before and I, at least on the agency level I've seen it go badly um, because the argument that is made by the agencies and the case law and the opposing councils is that you know I know a lot of seven-year-olds that swim better than a lot of 70-year-olds or 60-year-olds or 30-year-olds and so it can be viewed as a discriminatory act. All right. Okay. Um, let's see here. This is very specific. I'm not really going to get into that one. Um, this is uh, that's very specific as well. Uh, someone asks, can you deny sexual offenders? Um, that's probably not as obvious as it sounds, right, Michael? I mean, you, you want to look at what the nature of the offense is. Uh, if it poses a threat to person or property and it's recently enough, then, then you, you might very well be able to. Um, you know, the thing with some of these crimes, though, is you need to look at, at the particulars because sometimes you'll have a label of a crime. And I'm not saying any type of sexual offense is, is acceptable or good or reasonable, but sometimes these labels are deceiving when compared to what the actual crime was. And let's say it's something that maybe has some of the, the hallmarks and it's branding of something that it says makes everyone say, oh my gosh, but it's something that is maybe not the worst thing by comparison to the other types of crimes that fall under that umbrella. And it happened 30 years ago, um, you could have some issues there with that as well. Um, and I also think it's important to point out that, you again, you have to have it in your documents that you have the right to deny, right, Michael? It has to be in the association documents, not a rule that's been created by the association. A hundred percent. If a if a single family homeowner requests a wheelchair ramp for their own property, does the HOA have some kind of say in what they ultimately install through the through the DRB or ARC process? They have some say, yeah. I mean, you, but you have to, the, 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 this is why all of these areas deal with what we call the interactive dialogue. You want to get to the heart of what is necessary to allow the equal use and enjoyment. What alternatives are there out there? Um, if a person needs to have, I'll call it again, the, you know, the, 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 the pool chair lift to get into the pool, there may be different models. There may be some that have to be affixed to the deck. There may be some that don't have to be affixed to the deck. What, the end of, what matters at the end of the day is not the requesting party getting the exact model that they necessarily like the most, but it should be an interactive discourse that allows that person to equally enjoy and use the facilities. If they really like the pink pool chair lift, I'm making something up here, that doesn't mean they get the pink one because you don't need the pink one to get into the pool. You, you need to have, it has to be something that is reasonably tied to the necessary accommodation to allow for the equal use and enjoyment of the property. Right. Here's another one I hear very frequently. Can the pool area be off limits to ESA animals? No, not, no, it, 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 you, it, not, not as a, a broad stroke rule. You can't do that because what if, for instance, in order for me to, to ameliorate my life, one of my life functions, um, I need to, to have ESA in order to feel okay at the pool and be able to, to live my life. Um, if that is the case, then you get to bring the animal with you uh, there. Now, when it comes to in the pool, in the pool, then you could be dealing with a public health situation. So that, that, that is a little bit different there. Again, all of these things have to allow for equal use and enjoyment. You can't put that burden on others. So Fluffy can sit, sit, uh, sit on the, uh, the lounge chair, but Fluffy may not be able to go for a swim. Fair enough. 
Uh, I've heard this one a bunch too. I think this is important. Can someone have multiple ESA animals for one owner or one unit? Yes and no. Um, the answer is yes to the extent uh, for sure. This is one of the things you'll see in the memo. Uh, one of the things you can ask is what distinct function do each one serve? Um, if you have, let's say, an ESA for one purpose and then a CNI dog for another, well, that, that, that's something. Um, and you probably have to accommodate that. But if I just need, have, need to have seven emotional support animals because I'm, I'm, I'm really, really emotional and my wife tells me that a lot, that might not be good enough. Um, so you need to have a distinct purpose, I think, is something that you could engage in an analysis on on that level. But landmines there. So talk to counsel and really look at that one carefully because you may think, oh, gosh, they're both emotional support animals, but maybe they serve different emotional components. It's, it's not always ostensibly visible on the surface. Another super common one. I think you hit on it, but I want to ask it again because so many people ask us this. Can you limit ESA pets based on size and weight? That Mastiff is going to be hanging out in the elevator all day long, just loitering right there. No, there's nothing you can do, unfortunately, folks. If the animal's a nuisance or a danger to person or property, sure. So if you have a pit bull that's barking all the time, snapping at people in the hallway, that then you can do something about it. But if it's just a sweet pit bull that, that is just scary looking, but not, not causing any harm to anybody or, or, or property, there's nothing you can do, whether it's 100 pounds or, or 10 pounds. All right. Um, if an association has a policy of DNA sampling, can you uh, request registration of the support service animal uh, and subject it to the, the, the doggy DNA sampling? No, no, it's, it's risky to, to start doing any of that stuff. You, you might be able to do, you, I mean, you, it's very, very risky. I think you can make an argument that you could, you could require it from the perspective of making sure there is nothing that, you know, if the dog does its business and you don't pick up after it, but it, it, it's riddled with landmines. I highly, highly discourage it. I think there's an argument to be made, but I've also seen it go badly before. All right. Um, can an association require a, a down payment amount, i.e. 10% or more, or would that be considered discriminatory? Never heard that question before. I think that what you need to be thinking about here is it, it, this is just talking about, I assume we now left the service and support animals. Oh, yeah. um, and, we're now, and, and we're now talking about sale and lease approvals and, and condition, you know, the financial component and whether or not you can require a minimum down payment. Um, I will say that I think it's a risky one to do based on rulemaking authority, uh, meaning as opposed to being embedded in your declaration. I will also say, though, that after the financial crisis of 2008, not the one we might be in right now, uh, but the one in 2008, I helped a lot of associations pass amendments to their declaration that established minimum, minimum equity requirements. Um, so I definitely think you can do it in a declaration amendment. Doing it in rulemaking authority, you can make the argument, but you're talking about something very risky there because a lot of people are going to march into court and say, who the heck are you to try to say it's reasonable based upon vague rulemaking authority They'll tell me I can't sell my unit to somebody that is ready, willing, and able to give me the money I want because you're not happy there's not enough equity in the property. Real risky on, the re on a reasonableness analysis, but a declaration amendment is not subject to that same analysis. So if you want that, I'd go for a deck amendment. It would be the safer way to go. Right, right. And again, uh, all these things that can end you up in court are going to become very expensive potentially. So let's see here if there's any more um yeah i mean I, I think i think we hit a lot of this here's a very common one um you know neighbors who uh may have ma medical marijuana card um that sort of thing they're, they're smoking on the balcony and maybe they're smoking in the unit how does the uh you know the fha or the ada apply and, and what are associations allowed to do or not do relative to that so me medical marijuana is still a tricky one. Even though we have it now here in Florida, it's still illegal under federal law. Um, and, and no matter what you feel on the issue, it's a source of frustration for me as a lawyer in the sense that you have this conflict between state and federal law in so many jurisdictions in this area. What I will say is let's skip the part about it being illegal under federal law. Cigarettes, marijuana, whichever it might be, um, you know, th this is all about equal use and enjoyment. So if you have a no smoking policy or no marijuana policy in your building, 
there is a line that 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 you have to be mindful of when it comes to the accommodation. If you have that policy and someone presents the request, and let's say federal law doesn't exist anymore, and it says, you know, doc doc Dr. Smith has uh, now there's now now Mrs. Smith's son went to medical school. She's very proud. Dr. Smith um, is prescribing a medical marijuana card uh, for for Mrs. Berkowitz, and Mrs. Berkowitz is going to now be uh, enjoying some some marijuana to ameliorate her her disability a little bit. It's one thing if, if Mrs. If, if if she's going to be on her balcony doing that in a way that doesn't infringe with anybody's use. But if it's a chronic, if it's of such a nature that it's making it so others can't be on their balcony, if the smell is permeating the hallways, then then you're talking about infringing on the rights of others. But that this is something, while it's a dynamic area because of the conflict in federal and Florida law, um, you know, cigarettes, obviously nobody can say that they're doing that for health reasons. So you don't have to worry about that one. But with cigarettes, one thing that comes up is, um, you know, is it a nuisance activity? When you're dealing with the purpose of today's webinar, which is Fair Housing Act accommodations, marijuana, I think, could be something that is, is, is something that can be prescribed uh, as an accommodation. But you're traveling under the Florida law there probably exclusively because under federal law, it's still illegal. Uh, very, very long answer, but very convoluted area, just given the conflict between federal and Florida law. All right, well, we're going to end on that note. I think, Mike, we've gone a little long today. We tried to, get, I think, a lot of the questions that were left were... Uh, versions of ones that we'd already answered so again we did the best we could only have so much time so we appreciate everybody coming i can't thank michael enough for his time and expertise today i think he did a really great job of explaining some very complicated topics in a way that we could all digest uh, please do fill out the survey that we put on the screen it's very helpful to us to make sure that we're presenting the content that you guys are interested in and uh, we do better for the future. And uh, if you enjoyed our webinar today, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already. That's uh, getfan.org and also campbellevents.org. Again, campbellevents.org is where we post all of the previous webinars and any upcoming webinars so you can watch ones that have been recorded. Um, as well as sign up for future classes. So Michael, any uh, parting words today? Just to say thank you to you, Evan. Thank you to Ashley and the whole team at Campbell. It's always a pleasure to be out here. I, I appreciate the opportunity to spend lunch with everyone and I hope everyone has a, a wonderful rest of the summer and I'll hopefully look forward to seeing you in Zoom land sometime soon. If you need my contact information, it'll be in the PowerPoint and feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, yeah. Ashley, for your help. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Take care. Thanks for watching. For more great educational content, click the subscribe button now.